Well, thank you very much for the, the kind introduction and the, the opportunity to, to speak here today. Um, there, there have been quite some, some changes in this field. It's a rapidly changing field, but the most interesting thing, if, if you have worked in, in healthcare in the last, let's say, 15 years and try to make people aware of the role of sex and gender uh, in relation to, to diseases, COVID-19 has pretty much showed everybody uh, in how far sex and gender can matter. Uh, and this has kind of shifted um, a little bit the, the way we, we can be talking about this. Nevertheless, it does not automatically translate into a change of research practices, which is also quite interesting because people acknowledge a, a difference, uh, we'll see sex-based difference in mortality and also gender components play a role. Uh, however, that does not automatically mean that they change their practices. And so this is maybe also an interesting thing that we can discuss later. So I will touch on, on many different things briefly. We have about 15 to 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll try to give you to shine a light on, on several points and I'm more than happy to, to pick them up again in the discussion afterwards. So briefly about the mortality, which, which was the first indicator that uh, sex and gender might be at play here. Um, briefly about the biological differences and then sex and gender in, in clinical presentation. And then of course, how, how can we envision the whole COVID-19 discussion from a broader perspective and where do gender aspects come into play here at many different levels? So um, I don't think I need to convince many people of this anymore. This is a graphic and, and I picked one that's slightly older. You see it's, it's September, 2020. It's taken from the website of Global Health 5050, which is uh, an initiative that has collected uh, disaggregated data from all over the world since the beginning of the pandemic. I picked this older slide simply because now they have so much data from so many countries that there is not one slide that would fit all of this together anymore. So I prefer to take the older one just to show you that this would be an equal distribution of mortality between women and men. And what you see is that in pretty much most countries of the world, uh, men die in more significant numbers than women, although infection rates don't really change that much. Nevertheless, I was saying they, they collect data regularly from countries all over the world. They do in fact uh, provide information on, on as much as 90% of, of the world's countries. However, this reporting is of course dependent on what countries provide and what you see here is in how far all of these countries have provided disaggregated data on cases and death in the last month. And you see some countries do regularly provide this and others do provide either different disaggregated data on case numbers or death numbers and others don't provide any of the two in, in the last month. So although there, there is an increasing provision of, of disaggregated data, at least when it comes to cases and death, this is not something that is uh, systematically done worldwide. And we still see huge, huge gaps in data. Now, uh, Tlina has done a very good job already in, in delineating the, the differences between uh, sex and gender. And, and I think in the field of medicine, we are relatively adamant and, and categorical about separating them much more than, than other disciplines. Uh, and in general, what we do is everything that falls under the, let's say, broader umbrella of biology. So genetics or hormonal levels or anatomy and physiology, we classify under the umbrella of sex. Um, and everything I would say that has to do with humans as a whole, we classify under the umbrella of gender and, and allow me that, that formulation. So that of course also means that when we look at the infection with SARS-CoV-2 or uh, at COVID-19 disease, the possible modulators of disease. So whether you will get infected, whether you will have a severe disease, whether you might potentially die of this disease are related to both sex and gender. And what you see here is these are all in one way or another virally um, connected and, and hormonally and, and genetically connected aspects. And I'll go back to these. And what you see here already, and this is only in, in the healthcare system, uh, that we're looking at, at a broader perspective of potential, for example, exposure to the virus. So where are you working? Where are you living? Under which conditions uh, do you get protection? And so forth, which changes exposure? Uh, symptoms might be reported differently or might be taken seriously at a different degree. 
um, testing access might be different, protection might be different, uh, compliance with prevention might be different, and of course, recruitment for clinical trials might be different, most importantly, the analysis of these recruited data, people providing their data might be different. Going from there, I would uh, briefly start with the biological differences. And, and what we see here in, in comparison to, to many other diseases where um, the study of biological differences leading to, to potential differences in disease expression is kind of an afterthought. So it's something that, that happens later on. Um, given the differences in mortality and, and given really the, the strong biological plausibility in, in this case, looking at sex differences in uh, the development of the disease has actually been picked up by, by many researchers that have never really looked into this field before. However, when we look at this infection, it is true that there are several biological aspects that uh, justify the sex differences we're seeing. So the receptor for the virus is the ACE2 receptor, uh, which is encoded by a gene that we find on the X chromosome of which women have two and men generally have one. Um, and of course, that already means that potentially female organisms might have an advantage because not all, all genes on the second X are silenced. Estrogens seem to play a role in the expression of this receptor, which is what the virus uses to enter the cells. Um, and then there is this, this is a serine protease. So basically it's a secondary factor that is needed to make sure that the virus actually enters the cells. And this seems also to be regulated by hormones. And it has been described before that androgens play a role in its expression. Um, we have different lines of defense against viruses. Um, what, what is an essential line in addition to the adaptive immune system, so the antibodies we produce, the cells that get activated, is innate immunity. Um, and one of the receptors that has been uh, sought out here is TLR7. TLR7 is also an X-linked gene. So in this case, we actually have reports now of male patients doing much worse if they have mutations in TLR7, and this has not been reported in women. So again, another aspect that can contribute to potential severity of disease. We know that many of the immune cells that we have in the body behave slightly differently in women and in men and are recruited differently regardless of uh, COVID-19. And we know that in, uh, from other infections, viral infections, and from other vaccines that have been developed before that the response in women and men, in, in female and male organisms can be different, that generally female organisms produce higher degrees of antibodies might have a higher activation of these cells. So this was a publication that, was, um, that appeared at the beginning of the pandemic, so early on in 2020, when some of these things were still speculative. So this we knew, but many of these things were more speculation that we had to look into. And if any of you is actually working in the field of biology and wants to uh, dive deeper into this, I'm not gonna go in the molecular details of this. We have now a publication that came out about a year later in 2021. And, and now many of the hypotheses we had seen before are actually either confirmed, some have been refuted, but many have been confirmed uh, through research into this. And it's possibly one of the first times that we're actually seeing such targeted research into sex differences. And the fact that we were seeing differences in mortality has uh, supported the fact that researchers have been looking into this. And so what you see here is again, the entry of the virus, it has been confirmed. Um, that basically the whole first part of the process is more active in female organisms. So, so the sensing of the um, RNA, the way it is transcribed, uh, the way the body reacts to this. So this is interferon production. And then um, the T cell response is more pronounced. What is surprising is that possibly the B cell response and the, the antibody production might be slightly higher in men. So this is a bit counterintuitive. Well, we'll see if we confirm this. But this is just to show you that within a year, we've had a bulk of research and information coming out about potential sex differences, uh, about a novel and, and formerly unknown disease. And so if people ask, uh, is it, does it actually matter to look into sex differences? Yes, it does. And it is possible, apparently. So we have a quite good example of, of how research has picked up. 
But let's move a bit a bit further into what do we actually see in, in the hospital and what do we actually see in primary care and, and what does that mean for us? So we have by now already the first uh, meta-analysis about the symptoms of COVID-19. And overall, it seems that the disease is somewhat more symptomatic in men. It is also true that, as I said before, uh, there is a higher mortality in men and higher symptomatology can, of course, correlate with more severe disease and then potentially higher mortality. So that might, might be connected. We do see some variations of um, less typical symptoms. And this is a story we've heard before for, for other diseases. Uh, COVID-19 was initially thought to be only a respiratory condition. And only afterwards, we actually uh, found out that it has implication of pretty much every organ in the body. And that goes from the gastrointestinal system to the brain, uh, to the vessels, and so forth. So gastrointestinal systems seem to, symptoms, sorry, seem to be somewhat more common in women. And women, as I said, are often less symptomatic than men, so less frequently present with fever, shortness of breath, or cough. So let's say the typical symptoms. Um, well, overall, uh, this, this led to more hospitalization of men. And uh, what we're seeing now is, um, and what was initially not predicted because we, we have never seen it at this magnitude, is the long COVID. So long COVID is the persistence of symptoms way beyond the resolution of the initial infection. So you get infected, you have COVID-19 disease, uh, eventually you get better. So you don't have fever anymore. You, you don't shed the virus anymore, but your symptoms in one way or another, for example, the shortness of breath or um, difficulties in memorizing things or, or different difficulties in taste and smell or difficulties concentrating. So all kinds of different symptoms persist for much longer than, than the initial disease. So three to six months or maybe even longer. And, and this part, uh, addition to the disease seems to be somewhat more, more frequent in women, especially in postmenopausal women. I put this in brackets here because it is still emerging data. Of course, it's a new disease, so we're still collecting this data. But overall, we're seeing a higher prevalence in women. And, and most importantly, it also seems that um, women who initially had a less severe disease might actually have uh, potentially a high risk of long COVID. But as I said, this data is still accumulating, so I, I wouldn't um, put it as an, an absolute given. But it might well be that having less symptoms potentially increases a bit the risk of long COVID. Um, when it comes to therapy, well, um, there might be a correlation with the severity, and it might just reproduce what we have seen before. As I said before, uh, men more frequently have severe disease, so they're more frequently hospitalized, which of course is connected to the severity disease and admitted to the intensive care unit. Um, however, what we're also seeing that worldwide men uh, have been reported to receive more experimental therapies and that women seem to get less um, antibiotics, which might not make that much sense anyway, but if you have an associated infection, they might help antivirals, glucocorticoid therapy, which in fact helps, uh, and ventilation. Um, what is interesting besides the therapy of the acute disease is of course what's, what's going on in the media at the moment, and we might pick that up in discussion again, the severe side effects that we're seeing uh, upon vaccination seem to be almost exclus exclusively a female phenomenon, and that goes for the anaphylaxis cases reported with the mRNA vaccines, so that's the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, uh, and the thrombosis that are seem to be associated with the adenovirus-based vaccines, although um, we don't know if that's true for all adenovirus-based uh, vaccines, but definitely for AstraZeneca and J&J, and &J, as we're learning. So um, most uh, of these side effects, or in some cases exclusively these side effects, are affecting um, female recipients of the vaccine. Well, could we predict that? I would say yes and no. Um, and together with Matthias, who will, will speak later, and, and other colleagues, we, we looked into the consideration of sex and gender in, in clinical trials uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. So we first looked at it last year in, in June and July. 
uh, and we, we did an update right now. Um, so basically what we found then did not change that much. At the time we were looking at about 2,500 trials. Now we're looking at about 4,000. Um, at the time about 16, 17% explicitly reported that they uh, considered sex and or gender as a recruitment criterion and only four percent reported an intention to actually consider sex and gender upon analysis. Um, that has not really changed through too much throughout the pandemic. What has changed a little bit, what has improved a little bit is that the reporting in publications afterwards uh, of sex differentiated data has increased a little bit, but we're talking about one in five that might uh, report differentiated data and, and the rest tell, doesn't tell us anything about the impact of sex and or gender. Now, could that pick up the side effects we're seeing now? Well, that's another question because even the largest trials include about 50,000 individuals. And if a uh, severe side effect affects one in a million, uh, you might not be able to pick it up for the trial. Nevertheless, it's something worthwhile investigating. All right, now let's take a, a slightly broader look at, at what plays a role in the COVID-19 infection. I just saw that I transformed that into a COVID-10. Um, so when, when we look at the pandemic overall, the pandemic, of course, starts with a virus. So it is something that, that brings you to the hospital if you are unfortunate. But of course, it affects all dimension of our lives. So healthcare is only a fragment of, of what we're considering here. And this is where the pandemic becomes much more than a simply uh, biologically related event, but actually incorporates many different aspects. And that goes from the economy, if we think about the discussions initially, who are essential workers, who are these people, are they being protected, which industry are suffering, who works in those industries, uh, the political representation, basically who's sitting at the table and defining priorities for recovery, for allocation of, of support and so forth, who takes care of children, on, of family members, uh, who is actually in charge of those increased care needs and is that somehow being supported by the state? How safe are people during uh, the pandemic if, for example, we have curfews and you have to stay at home? And of course, if we have to find new solutions and we have to innovate, who is actually given the space and the funds to, to produce innovation? I cannot go in all of these. I just give you a brief uh, spotlight on, on a few of these. So this is one study from Italy, and that was uh, 520 Italian heterosexual couples during April 2020 lockdown. And they were looking at how did the burden of, of housework and childcare change in these couple, couples throughout uh, those first months of lockdown. And what you see, um, which might, let's put it like this, initially positively is that the partners of these women seem to be more engaged in childcare than they were before. Uh, however, you also see that the engagement in, in housework is somewhat uh, reduced to before. So everybody says they do more, but the, the increase in women, the relative increase is higher than in their partners. And then of course you need to see, well, but what's the baseline? And if we consider that about 20% of the partners said that initially they did zero hours of housework altogether, or the majority allocated the time spent on housework between zero and one hours, of course, this magnitude change has a different flavor than when, when both are equally engaged before. So what we're seeing is that uh, there is uh, uh, an increase in participation of apparently both partners. However, the baseline is different, which means that at the end, if we consider this, uh, potentially the burden lies still more on, on the shoulders of the working women than their partners. When it comes to politics, um, the representation we all know, of course, matters. And the, the topics that are being discussed at the table are somewhat linked to who is sitting at the table. I mean, even with the best intentions, um, you cannot experience the, the life of, of everybody you're representing. But unfortunately enough, if you look at this paper, you see that of all uh, the, the COVID-19 decision-making bodies and expert task forces worldwide, and here 87 countries were included, only 3.5% uh, 
uh, identified gender parity, and that was 40 to 60 percent participation of, of uh, women and men. So that was uh, the, the way they analyzed it. Uh, and in 85 percent, somewhat unsurprisingly, the majority were men, which of course has an impact on the set priorities. In the workforce representation, this is healthcare. We all know that uh, the majority of healthcare workers worldwide are women, but the representation in leadership, and this is uh, still a positive outlook, I would say, uh, is mostly men. So you see this imbalance, but why is that important? Because during the pandemic, of course, the question was who is mostly exposed? And we were seeing that when it came to healthcare workers, women were more likely to get infected than men, and this is uh, Spain and Italy, which might well be related to this, because if you're sitting in a managerial position, in a leadership position, your potential contact with patients on the ward and your risk of being infected is lower than if you're actually at the lower level of the, the healthcare hierarchy. So that might well be related and, and constitute uh, a, a gender specific risk factor. My last two slides, uh, what did that mean for us as academics? And that is early on in the pandemic and the numbers only get worse. Um, of course, as I was showing before, what happened to the family and, and uh, household uh, chore burdens on, on uh, uh, female and male researchers in this case, uh, of course it takes a toll. And when it came to looking at uh, submissions in, in the early months of the pandemic between January and April, you can see that men in general, male researchers submitted more compared to female researchers here. We were all still quite positive and everybody kind of submitted more throughout the pandemic. The numbers uh, actually decrease and people start um, submitting less so even these numbers switch. But why is that important? Why is it important overall that uh, people participate and why do these shifts in participation make sense? And here I'm actually citing Matthias who will be speaking after me, who did this, this research on the inclusion of uh, gender sensitive analysis in healthcare publications. And what they basically showed was that increased participation of women as first authors, as last authors, and as, uh, as members of, of a group publishing increase the likelihood of gender sensitive analysis. And if we consider that sex and gender sensitive analysis is still underrepresented in trials, is underrepresented in publications and research overall, the loss potentially or the lack of participation of women researchers might have an impact on the information we are obtaining. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. I can ask with the, just one question and it's uh, about, um, I have several questions, but I think uh, the, the vaccine, I think that's something everyone is talking about these days. And I just wonder, is when developing these vaccines, did they take into account the differences between men and women that you show obviously exist? So in a way, there are some knowledge about how vaccines influences differently in, in men and women and what that knowledge taken into account when developing these vaccines. So I would put it like this. I think they did a relatively good job in recruitment. So uh, actually in all of the, the major vaccine trials, they've really placed a lot of attention on trying to have a somewhat balanced uh, recruitment so that, that women and men were equally represented. In some of the US trials, they even tried to make sure that ethnic minorities were adequately represented. So I think when it comes to the intentions, I think they did a pretty good job. And I think that is, that is definitely something um, that uh, needs to, to be pointed out. I think the, the issue is uh, more of could this have been picked up or not? And quite frankly, if you consider that these are very rare side effects that we're talking about right now. So the severe anaphylaxis, um, if you have like, I don't know, 90 cases in you know, 100 uh, million people being vaccinated, it's really rare. And the same thing goes for the thrombosis where now we're looking at, depending on which vaccine you're looking uh, at anywhere between one in a hundred thousand to one in a million risk. And this is something that even the best powered trial will not pick up. And this is actually a reason why it is so important to have pharmacovigilance. And it is important that we're actually seeing the due process working. I mean, it kind of 
makes people insecure on the one hand side. On the other hand, the agencies are picking this up and investigating this. And this is also something that we should point out. What I think, however, is important is what, what happens now and how do we deal with this? If we look at Canada and the US, for example, who, you know, what comes to Zolpidem, which is a sleeping pill, uh, suggest to use a half dosage for women compared to men, which also provoked an outcry and people had to discuss about this, but they're doing it. So in a way, there's a precedent. And it seems like in, in Europe, we definitely don't even consider uh, a potential adaptation based on this. So what I would say is they have done a good job in designing this up to the point where we get data. But now that we are at the point of using this information and thinking about public health implications and so forth, it's like we're completely sex and gender blind again. And, and mm -hmm. we're actually not taking that into consideration. No, thank you. Uh, this is also, I think it's very interesting because um, on the one hand, we can see that actually gender and sex and gender issues has been picked up, for instance, in the newspapers in Norway, that we do see that uh, men has uh, more severe, um, they, they, they hospitalize uh, easier or quicker uh, in a way. Um, but this, uh, very, very serious uh, effects of the vaccine in Norway. It has been the AstraZeneca vaccine, especially. Seems as a surprise also uh, for uh, the authorities that it has these effects because some just said, well, look at the statistic. Isn't it mostly women that get these uh, serious effects of the vaccine? But this seems as a surprise. So. Does that mean that also, <laughs> how do we communicate medical uh, knowledge on this? Is this like a secret? <laughs> no, but I, I think it's, it's what we're, I mean, I think what we're seeing is a lot of uh, how important science communication is and how we're failing at a lot of it, quite frankly. I think this is really a, a case study in what is working well and what is not working so well. So I think the point here is, um, the thrombosis that have been associated with these vaccines are a very rare and specific type. So it's not like the swollen leg or lung thrombosis, which are, if you want, the risk factors that you have with a pill. And there is quite some communication going on in social media, throwing everything in one pot. And yes, you do have an increased risk of thrombosis if you are pregnant or if you're taking oral contraceptives. And that's all true. Uh, and so the likelihood of having an event there is, of course, much higher than this. However, we're also talking about two slightly different types of thrombosis. And, and what we're seeing here is a really rare and specific type. So it's kind of a combination of a rare type of thrombosis in a, in a strange location, if you want to say, in the brain, um, plus an autoimmune reaction associated. So it is per se, I think people are more surprised on the medical side because it is kind of a new entity. We, we have not, we have seen similar uh, reactions, but not this specific type of reaction. So that's why people are surprised. Um, the fact that thrombosis are somewhat higher, that there is a certain risk in the population, this could have been expected. As I said before, these events are so extremely rare that they could not have been predicted, even with the best trial. I mean, you cannot do a trial with 10 million people. That, that's just not possible. That's when you roll it out. So I think in the trial, it, it was not predictable. However, it's what we do with this information now and how do we deal with it and how do we make sure that we have systems that are in place that pick up the fact that the risk is higher in women, especially in a certain age group, that we need to do certain type of very specific tests, that we need to inform um, healthcare professionals, especially primary care professionals of the potential symptoms people might be reporting. So I think the fact that we basically have to set out a system that is not gender blind, because ingrain that in, in how we navigate this, this is what, what we should be doing now. And this is really where we have so little experience because we have so little experience with sex and gender sensitive healthcare practice overall. And, and I think this is where, where we need to be looking at right now. Mm -hmm.